how do computers work? From the outside, it can look like pure wizardry. But if you can follow what I'm doing with this division by two, then you already know enough to understand how computers work. Stay with me to the end of the video, and I'll show you. This is a simple one-bit computer that I'll build in this playlist. Given enough time and memory, it can compute anything that the most powerful supercomputers can compute. Just much slower. I could even create my own Bitcoin mining farm out of these. I'll come back to this later, but we need to go over the arithmetic again. Now, I know no one particularly likes this, but... Let's say we teamed up and hypothetically made a killing with our Bitcoin farm, and at the end of it, we had 378 million, 134,876 dollars to share. But now we want to independently determine what our share should be. So 3 divided by 2 is 1 with 1 remainder. The remainder in the 7 makes 17. 17 divided by 2 is 8 with a remainder of 1. Remainder of 1 with 8 is 18, divided by 2 is 9, with no remainder. 1 divided by 2 is 0, with remainder 1. 13 divided by 2 is 6, remainder 1. 14 divided by 2 is 7, remainder 0. 8 divided by 2 is 4. 7 divided by 2 is 3, remainder 1. And 16 divided by 2 is 8. You'll notice that I started at the left and moved right one character at a time. Sometimes I wrote down the remainder. And sometimes I just remembered it. How did I know what to do each time I came across a new digit? Well, somewhere in the deep, dark recesses of my brain, there's a table that looks something like this. If I see a symbol and there's no remainder from the last digit, then I just treat it as the number seen and divide it by 2. 0 divided by 2 is 0 with no remainder. But 7 divided by 2 is 3, and there is a remainder for the next digit. So this begs the question, what do we do if there was a remainder from the last digit? Well, in my mind, I add 10 to the number I see. This time I treat 0 as 10. 10 divided by 2 is 5 with no remainder. 7 I treat as 17. Divide by 2 is 8 with remainder of 1. Hopefully this is just all revision. This time I'm going to do something tricky. I'm going to start with our original number and start at the left edge again. But this time, instead of writing the number above it, I'm going to erase one digit at a time and write the answer there. Rather than writing down the remainder, I'm just going to try and keep track of it in my head. Now, it's not as clean as the other method, and it's much easier to make a mistake, but I should be able to apply the same rules and get the same answer. There we go. 189,067,438. The next thing I want to do is write some software that mimics this process. If you're not familiar with writing software, don't worry too much, I'll provide pictures along the way as well. I want to divide by 2 using these rules I've just established, rather than using the machine's divide or multiply instructions. And I'm not going to use shift right either. If you think you know how to do this, stop the video now and have a crack at it and then rejoin once you're done. I've downloaded a copy of Visual Studio 2022. This is free, thank you Microsoft. All right, let's begin. I'm creating a new console application. Let me just make sure that it works. Yep, that looks good. I'll get rid of some of these auto-generated comments. Now I'm going to generate our main data structure, which is the rulebook. Each unit is a struct with three elements, next, direction, and right symbol. And I'm going to define left and right as being minus one and plus one respectively. You can think of this as being a bit like a 3 by 5 inch flashcard. The different fields are titled in red, and the date is filled in in blue. I want to instantiate the rulebook to be a two-dimensional array of this structure. One index into the array will be the rule number, which is limited by the number of rules, which I've set to 100. And the other index into the array will be a symbol, and I'm going to set that to be a maximum of 256. Although in this example, I really only need two rules and 10 symbols. If I go back to the flashcard analogy, I'm setting up a grid of 10 by 2 cards, and each card can be uniquely indexed by a symbol and a rule number. I need to write some code that'll set the values in the rulebook. For this example, I want to use the rules associated with dividing by 2, and in this case, there are only really two rules that we need to worry about. 
Rule zero is when there's no remainder or carry from a previous digit. And I'm going to use the terms carry and remainder a little bit interchangeably here. The second rule, rule one, is when there is a remainder or carry from a previous digit. Then, for each rule, we need to define what happens for every possible character we might come across in the equation. And for that, I've made these three strings of 10 characters each. And I've used 10 characters because there are only 10 symbols we could possibly see. Well, at least for this example of division by two. Now, I hope this is pretty obvious, but when there's no remainder and I see a zero or a one, I just write a zero over the top of it. If I see a two or a three, I write a one over the top of it. Four or five, I write two. Six or seven, I write three. And eight or nine, I write four. When there is a remainder, then I'm really writing a one in front of the digit. So if I see a zero, it really means it's a 10, so I write five. If I see the one symbol, it means it's 11, so I write five as well. Two and three are 12 and 13, so I write six. Four and five are 14 and 15, so I write seven. Six and seven are 16 and 17, so I write eight. And finally, eight and nine are really 18 and 19, so I write nine. For the remainder, I know that for all even numbers, the remainder will be zero, and for all odd numbers, the remainder will be one. So we just get this pattern of repeating zero ones for the remainder string. So for any possible symbol I might see, I know what to write over the top of it, given whether I have a remainder or not. Now I need to write some code that just copies the value in these strings into the rule book itself. I'm going to use a hash to find to enumerate values for both rules. Copy the right symbol values one at a time. If this value has a remainder, meaning it's odd, then set the next rule to be remainder. Otherwise, set the next rule to be no remainder. Then finally, we set the direction to be right, and that's because when we do division, we go from left to right. We can copy these values and modify them slightly for the rule where remainder is set, which mainly involves modifying the right symbol. What I've done here is the equivalent of filling out all the fields with the blue pen. So now the flashcards contain all the information I need to do the division. When we start, there's no remainder, so we start in rule zero. And we set the notepad right pointer to be zero as well. Now that reminds me, I haven't actually set up the notepad yet. The notepad is just a string of symbols, and it's literally analogous to the notepad we do our arithmetic on. I've added a dollar symbol at the end to tell the machine to stop. So now, I'm going to make a loop which continues until I'm over the dollar symbol. This code is just for printing the output. I want the caret symbol to be displayed on the digit we're currently investigating. Now we're getting to the heart of the algorithm. I start at the left and I want to read the first symbol, which is a 3 in this case. I generate a new variable called symbol and I load it with the value on the notepad pointed to by the notepad pointer. To keep things human readable, I've used ASCII instead of decimal, but I need to do that conversion now. I can just subtract the value of the character zero. Now that I know the rule and the symbol, I can directly look up the next rule from the rule book. This is like choosing a card and reading the next field off it. I can write the new symbol over the top of the old symbol on the notepad. This is analogous to reading the right symbol on our card. Then rubbing out the old symbol and writing the new symbol over the top of it. And then I could move left or right over the notepad. In division, we always move right, so this is like scooting over by one position. Once I've done all that, I make the next rule the current rule. Finally, I just print out the result. Now let's see if this code can actually divide by two. We'll zoom in and take a closer look and compare how well it does against my handwritten version. So the caret top symbol tracks where we are in the equation. It only operates on one symbol at a time, which is how we do it as humans. It writes the output over the input symbol for that position, and then moves one position to the right. It keeps doing this, keeping track of the remainder internally. And when it gets to the end, we have the right number. Excellent. OK, I promised to show you some magic at the start of the video. But before we go to the full kitten caboodle, here's just a little taste. If I change the data in the rule book, 
change where we start and finish on the notepad, then move left instead of right every iteration, then executing the same code, I multiply by two instead of divide by two. I'm not going to go through each digit. I'll leave that as an exercise for you to do at home, but the answer is correct. Hopefully what I've demonstrated is the need to be able to move right or left depending on the nature of the problem you're trying to solve. Division goes left to right. Multiplication goes right to left. All right, now for the real magic show. This time I'm going to create a Windows desktop application. This is all auto-generated code, but now I'm going to generate a new file and copy the program I just wrote into it. I'm going to increase the number of rules to 4,000 hex, but reduce the number of symbols to four. And I'm going to make a really big notepad. I'm going to get rid of the old code, which I used to program the rulebook, get rid of the print statements in the main loop, and now write some code that imports the rulebook from an external file. I'll skip through the code pretty quickly here, but if you want to go through it line by line, I'll leave a link below to the GitHub repository. From that, you should be able to tell how the data is packed and unpacked. Now I'm going to import the contents of the notepad from an external file. I'm just going to make a small change to the main loop that does the arithmetic, get rid of the ASCII conversion, and change the name of the function. I'm also going to limit the size of the notepad pointer in case there's a bug. I need to put the prototype for these two new functions into the header, then make sure they get called from the right section of the auto-generated code. This program compiles and appears to be running, but I can't tell what it's doing. For those not too familiar with coding, don't worry too much about the details of the next two minutes. I'm just adding some output routines so we can see what the machine's doing. We've already done the most important bit, and none of the following code changes what's written on the notepad or the contents of the rulebook. Instead of just printing the contents of the notepad, I want to insert a breakpoint when the code hits a particular rule. Specifically, I want it to stop when it hits rule 7477, which for now I'll call write memory. Compile and run. Excellent, the machine stopped at rule 7477. Now I don't want you to get too caught up in the details about how I know this, but let's just assume the notepad contains a 16-bit address and an 8-bit data value laid out bit sequentially from location 141 to 166. Let me hard code those values. I step through the notepad one symbol at a time for each of data MAR low and MAR high, and then I convert MAR high and MAR low into an address. The important thing I want you to note is that I haven't changed any of the information on the notepad or in the rulebook. I'm just passively reading off some symbols on the notepad. Now I'm going to make an even more outrageous assumption that some of this data is actual pixel data. Let's compile and run it again. That seems to be working. Now I'm going to make the most outrageous assumption of all. That is, that the format of this data and addressing scheme is compatible with Apple II high-res mode. Steve Wozniak used this rather complex addressing scheme for Apple II high-res mode. So we have to dewoz the address to get back to a line and column number. If you don't understand how this works, don't worry too much. I did a whole video on this, which is linked above. Essentially, we just need to chop up the address, move it round a little bit, then reassemble it as the line number. Finally, we need a way of writing this pixel value to the screen. I'm going to use the set pixel routine, which I know is slow, but to be honest, I don't think this is going to be the rate limiting step. All right, let's give this puppy a whirl. That's interesting. It seems to have written the number 10. And now it's written it again. Let's speed this up a bit faster. Our little machine that we designed to divide numbers by two appears to be playing Pac-Man. All we did was change the contents of the notepad and the rule book. Now that's real magic. The way we manipulate symbols on a piece of paper when we multiply by two or divide by two is exactly how a Turing machine works when it's performing a computation. If we're not too worried about the machine halting, then this piece of code acts as a Turing machine. The Turing machine is named after its inventor, Alan Turing, who now adorns the 50 pound note. But how does this explain why our divide by two machine can play Pac-Man? The answer is the Church Turing thesis. The Church Turing thesis, formerly commonly known simply as Church's thesis, says that any real world computation can be translated into an equivalent computation involving a Turing machine. 
It must be stated, though, that there are conflicting points of view about the Church Turing thesis. One says that it can be proven, and the other says that it serves as a definition for computation. There has never been a proof, but the evidence for its validity comes from the fact that every realistic model of computation, yet discovered, has been shown to be equivalent. In our case, our divide by two machine is a Turing machine, which we can implement with these seven lines of code. On this, we can emulate another Turing machine, the Apple II computer with a 6502 microprocessor. Then on top of this emulation, we can play Pac-Man, albeit rather slowly. How do I know that our Apple II is a form of a Turing machine? Well, I can write 6502 assembler code that emulates a Turing machine, a divide by two machine in this case. What we've been doing all along, in fact, is run code on a desktop PC, which is Turing complete, meaning it's a form of a Turing machine. This can emulate the Turing machine we designed, which emulates the 6502 microprocessor, which in turn plays Pac-Man. This all seems a little circular at first, but it means that our simple Turing machine that we've developed, given enough time and memory, can emulate any processor ever built. In my humble opinion, this is the magic behind the CPU and behind computers in general. This video has been deliberately software-oriented, but in the next video I'm going to build this machine, the Pure Turing. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Press the notification bell to be informed when the next video is ready.